Welcome to this edition of When the Biomass Hits the Wind Turbine, a discussion of sustainable living and what that means to you and me. I'm Jay Warmke. And I'm Annie Warmke. You are Annie Warmke. And today we're going to talk about creating a family foundation or the really nice challenge to have about how to give away your money. And we're joined today by Hailey Voss. Welcome, Hailey. Hello. Yeah, okay, well, great, Hailey. Um, why don't you tell us just a little bit about yourself and and then we'll start grilling you uh, to see if what you just said is true, okay? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, my name is Hailey Voss and I'm the president of the Sugarbush Foundation at Ohio University. And I am um, the daughter of Donna and Marianne Flournoy and they are the founders of the Sugarbush Foundation. Uh, and I and my brother Eli, and now others of our family serve on the Sugar Bush Foundation along with other community members. We have the honor of being able to figure out how to give away money um, in our community in a sustainable, to promote sustainability and environmental, um, environmental sustainability and economic sustainability. So one of the things that I was really impressed with was the story of how this all came about. And I was hoping you'd share with us um, the story of your mom and her inheritance. Yes. Back in, I think it was 2005, my mom received a large inheritance and she decided, she and my dad together, that they wanted to make a difference in the community where they live. And oh, wait a minute. Didn't she say at first she didn't think she wanted it? No, she didn't want it. Yeah, that's the part I wanted you to talk about. Because <laughs> that's the part I can really relate to. That, that, she didn't want to really change her life. She was very, very, very happy being in Athens, Ohio. But then her friend Carol Cure, her best friend, said, but Marianne, think about what good you could do with this money. So Carol helped her to think about how um, she could position this money to make a, an impact in the community. And... Also, uh, then they worked with Kelly Katowski and Bob Gall, the attorney, um, to figure out how it might work to harness the, the energy and, and um, intellectual resources of the university with the knowledge and the experience of the people in, working in the community to try to address um, issues of environmental sustainability and economic sustainability. So can you talk a little bit about how they came to understand phrases like collaboration and uh, asset-based community development? Uh, were those things that people were really talking about much in 2005? Yes. Um, I was just learning in those days um, I, because I was brought to the board was my being brought to the board at the beginning was my introduction to all that. But my mother had done a doctorate at Ohio University on appreciative inquiry, which is um, a, a, a model that is looks at what is there that's worth building on that what is worth um, enhancing. And it's a strength based model, an asset-based model, and it works well with asset-based community development. Um, and it celebrates what is there and builds on that rather than looking always at problems and having a deficit model of always constantly looking at problems, which is the problem-solving model. Sometimes you do have problems you need to solve, but it is a more positive experience when you build on what is what is already working and make it work better. So, um, so basically it would be looking at assets, not necessarily assets that are financial, but really the whole picture, wouldn't it? Assets can come in many forms. It can be your natural resources. The beauty of this region is one of our best assets. You can also have the experience of the people. The, the people are, are, are an asset. You, you also can take something that people think is a problem and look at it as an asset, and you get a whole different story. For example, waste. One of our, uh, our very longest uh, lasting project that we've been walking with has been the Zero Waste Initiative, where we 
uh, look at waste, things that people throw away and want to get out of out away from them and say, no, m- much of this is an asset. It's just we have to figure out how to make it that. And so if you know that you have to look at your waste as an asset, you have a whole different way of looking at it because then you have to figure out how to actually turn it into a job, a new resource, a repurpose, upcycle, recycle, um, and then you you make an asset out out of it. So in doing that, what, what, what really began to happen then, just if that's the example, we could talk about zero waste. So what, what happened after everybody kind of turned it upside down and sideways and um, what, what came of that? Well, the, they started out by doing a big uh, study of our area and what was going on in the area of, of waste. And in our area, we, uh, uh, Athens and Hawking County, are joined together in their solid waste districts. We were only recycling uh, between eight and nine percent of of uh, our recycling rate was only between eight and nine percent. And so that was one of the lowest in the state. Um, and the studies that we did and bringing people together to discuss about these things um, and beginning to organize around this led to. Um, the Athens Hawking Recycling Center um, building the um, materials recovery facility out in the plains that created, uh, I think, 17 jobs that were union, you know, good wage with benefits jobs. And it increased our recycling rate up to 36 percent, which is one of the better ones in the state now. So that is an example of how you turn your waste into an asset. Um, now, there's other things that have happened. For example, our zero waste um, events production um, team that was built out of Rural Action. Rural Action has been one of our primary partners um, that we've funded, and they've done a lot of this work. Um, the, the Zero Waste Initiative is housed out of Rural Action and is in partnership with the Voinovich School at Ohio University. But they um, uh, created a business that handles the waste at large events like music festivals or, um, other kinds of outdoor events. And, um, they set up how the flow of, of trash will go and some of it into composting, some of it into recycling. And, um, they have been able to divert 90% or more of, uh, the trash from going to the landfill from all these events. I think last year they had gotten up to 11 states that they were doing um, events in. Now, of course, COVID shut events down, so they've had to pivot. <laughs> but um, this is an example how a business could be started to turn the the waste into an asset. So it sounds to me like what you're saying is you identify things in your community that seem to work and then you guys come in and say all right we want to help you work better we want to help you expand that kind of thing does that apply in with say for instance the administration of of the fund because uh, you've said several times that you're affiliated with ohio university and i'm not quite sure how that works or or what that the, means the sugar bush foundation when my mom and dad started it they gave the money to Ohio University. So it serves as a supporting organization of the Ohio University Foundation, but its model is to create these partnerships between the university and the community. So every every <clears throat> um, project that we fund is a collaboration between community partners and the university to, um, to tackle some of these issues. Um, another one, another one well, of our. Let me let me just ask this question. So, how is a, how is the university connected to, like, for example, the zero waste project you just talked about? Well, there's a lot of ways. Um, Ohio University has a, a strong sustainability um, goal um, to re- you know to make itself carbon neutral and to reduce its. Um, carbon footprint and in different ways. 
And so we often are um, um, walking alongside the Office of Sustainability and in, in what we're doing. Um, but for example, uh, the athletics, um, the, all their athletic events have begun to enter into doing things of recycling at large events and looking into composting. Ohio University has a composting facility that was um, a, a wonderful um, addition to, to helping them to reduce their food waste. And um, there's a number of different ways that the university is involved um, <clears throat> in, in reducing their own waste. Do, do they work directly then with the Zero Waste Project? Yes, they're, it's a partnership. So they're, oh. they, they have their own goals of what they're doing, but the Zero Waste Initiative helps them to work towards those goals. And, and I want to make sure on the university side is help, like we'll fund a, a graduate student or undergraduate students who will use this as their focus of, of their activity. Um, and they'll, so that they'll help to move things along. Okay. Well, I wanted to make sure everybody understood too, that the Sugarbush Foundation does more than just, you know, zero waste. You've got some other programs out there. Oh that, yeah, that we, fund a, uh, we fund um, a variety of things, but uh, the next one I think I would be fun to discuss would be the um, what's called true pigments. There is a lot of legacy from the old coal mining um, era of acid mine drainage into our local streams, <clears throat> and Rural Action has been involved in helping clean up these streams for the last 25 years, but there were some particularly uh, enormous um, seeps, acid mine drainage seeps, where basically rust is coming out of the, um, the holes that are, the water underground has been flowing through old abandoned coal mines and picking up iron ore, and then it flows out into um, the area streams and just turns it orange, and some of you may have seen these orange areas in the streams and nothing lives there. It's, it's just, uh, just rust except this very bright green algae is very, it can be actually kind of beautiful in a <laughs> way. I remember, I remember riding on the school bus and looking out and seeing basically all the creeks around were, were bright orange. Like you said, it was, it was, yeah. um, well, raccoon Creek, but we were glad yeah. that raccoon Creek looked like that when we were young, because it meant no rattlesnakes would cross it. And so we didn't <laughs> oh, have okay. a trouble with that. I'll, I'll put up with the rattlesnakes. I'm glad highly keep, keep <laughs> cleaning well, up well, the stream. Right? Rural action has been working on these, uh, several different watersheds, but in, in Sunday Creek, um, watershed, they have got it all the way cl cleaned, all the way to within seven miles of the Hawking River. But then the largest acid mine drainage seep is at True Town, and it's coming out six thousand gallons. I mean, six thousand pounds of iron ore, dissolved iron ore, coming out per day. Wow, that's amazing! In the ground, it's it the the force of the water is coming out at a thousand gallons a minute, and that's bringing with it. Uh, 600 pounds of iron ore per day or about 2 million pounds per year coming out of this one place. And so we helped to test a technology that was developed at the university uh, through the engineering department with Dr. Guy Riefler um, to precipitate the iron ore out of the water and to get it... Um, into a powdered form, which they bake. Um, he works with uh, art um, art professor John Sabra, and they bake that powder into um, pigments of different colors because different temperatures create these beautiful colors. Some the not just that rust color, but also the color of um, a crimson color. There's a, a mustardy color. There's a even a violet color, depending on the temperature and these are being sold then to make into paints okay and well highly i'm going to interrupt you just for a second <laughs> for our for our station identification but we'll get right back on that i want to remind everyone you are listening 
to When the Biomass Hits the Wind Turbine with Jay and Annie Warmke. Reminding you once again, it is indeed the end of the world as we know it. And apparently, thank God. Thank God, yeah. And we're joined <laughs> today by Hailey Voss. And Hailey, um, we've been talking about how your foundation, uh, in association with Ohio University, has been um, trying to do some sustainable activities. And you were just talking about turning dirty creeks. Acid mine drainage. Acid mine drainage. I know, I know, I know. But we're, <laughs> we're basically, you're going to paint the landscape with the landscape. Is that right? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> so once they precipitate the iron ore out of the water, then they are able to return clean water into the stream and they are selling the the iron ore. So what's happening is that they're in the process of preparing to build a water treatment facility there at True Town that will um, clean the water the rest of the way. And um, it'll be interesting to see what happens because I heard that um, downstream from Tr True Town is the Burr Oak Water District. And they have been having to remove almost 2 million pounds of iron ore from their water each year in order to clean the water for people to drink it. Um, and they have just had to, they've just been landfilling that iron ore. Well, now it's going to wow. be taken out and they're going, and it's going to be taken out in advance. So I think that the water that comes to them is going to be, that's going to save them a lot of money because they're going to not have to clean the waters from so much. They're going to have a lot less, uh, B extra stuff besides water in their water and the um and the the uh, iron ore that we have that's used for paint pigments and it, colorations for uh, concrete and stones and things like that primarily is sourced from china so here we have it right here locally and we're going to be able to um begin to interrupt the market so that's an example of turning your waste into an asset. Yeah, it just reminds me, I think it was a quote from Buckminster Fuller. He said, pollution is just a resource that hasn't yet been developed. So, exactly. Yeah, that's great. Okay. Uh, do you have any other poster children of, of uh, activities that you've been doing? Because uh, uh, that one is pretty <laughs> sure. cool. I wanna, well, I wanna... well, Ohio's winding road, you know, uh, a lot of, um, one of the challenges that we have in every rural region, but particularly for us in Southeastern Ohio, is being in a rural area, um, we don't have any of the advantages uh, of, you know, big marketing opportunities and things like that. And um, I've been watching Ohio's Winding Road, which is a new name in the last couple this of years. This is a tourism thing, right? Yeah. And, um, and when they were getting started down and... Um, oh, shoot, I can't think of the name of the town, but where the coal, where the... Money. Uh, yeah. Corning? Yeah. Corning. Oh, uh, when they first started, I went down there for a, an event they had to look at the um, videotape they had made and listen to their little audio stuff. And, um, and so they've benefited us. They featured us and they have beautiful publications and they've helped some of our uh, other women farmers that I work with. So is and, this a project of? Yes. Of this Bush is one Foundation? of the Sugar Bush Foundation's younger projects that we've walked with not as long, but it has great, great potential. And we're very excited about where they're going. But basically, they're creating for people who live in rural areas, but have something that they want to share with the world, whether it's arts, um, whether it's tourism, something, some kind of a destination experience, outdoor recreation, that kind of thing. There's, it's hard for um, everybody because in this region, because we're all spread apart from each other and there's, it's hard to get a common, to get your voice to be known or to, where do you go to, to, be, to be noticed? And so they're creating a, a shared marketing platform and meeting together in networks to, to plan together and to work together. It's a very... Um, decentralized kind of a of a a network that that is basically all the people who would benefit from this 
shared marketing platform, like a, a, a plat, they're working towards having a platform where you could have shared booking. You can book through this um, platform where you can um, learn about opportunities and you could plan a trip. You want to come down past the Hawking Hills and you want to come further on into our area, into our region, but you don't know where to go. You can plan out a trip. You can find out where you would stay. You could f find out where you could hike, where you could do mountain biking, where you could go for dinner, where you can go for a show, where you can um, camp, where, you know, just where you can get fresh produce and um, et cetera, um, ex experience our area. And we're, we're growing our experience economy, growing our destination economy here because we have a lot to offer. It's just been hard for us to, you know, let it be known that this is a place you can come. Well, one of the challenges I see though, is that um, the meetings often are in very far away places, not easy to get to. Corning is tough. And one time when I went to one of the meetings, they'd closed the road and I had to, I had to get back to do chores and I was an hour and a half longer. One of the challenges of rural life. I know. Well, but, well we've been but talking. Wait a minute, I'm no, not no, done. No. The, right, other, right. the other part is that, um, that, you know, we don't have broadband and I don't want to get off on that, but so they have challenges. I think one of the things they've done really well um, this holiday season is they created a pop-up market and uh, we bought a bunch of coffee from uh, Dirty Girls in uh, in uh, Gloucester, mm -hmm. and we didn't even know about them. And so I think they're they're little by little doing what they can with the limitations, which are really sometimes insurmountable. Okay, well we've been we've been talking about some of the good things that the foundation is doing, but I wanted to back up just a little bit because one of the things I find interesting is your mother's first reaction when inheriting money was, "Oh no, this is this is bad. This is a problem." And I think most people would not have that reaction. So I, I I understand it. And I think she was very wise in that. But what you then say, okay, we now have a problem. We've got all this money. The solution, which is obvious today, but I suspect there were a lot of issues getting through from there to here. So you were involved with the foundation in the early days. What were some of the real big challenges or or concerns that you all had to map through to say, okay, we've got this cash, we want to get rid of it. <laughs> it, it is, well, it's, it's now belongs to Ohio University, so it's not ours. Uh, we, but, <laughs> okay, but problem it, solved, it here you go. <laughs> so it was set up in such a way that we could, um, that we could, that our family could continue to be a part of, of shaping the direction in which it would go. So that's a real honor. That's a real honor. And I will say my mother came from a very, Dallas suburban um, background, and she really fled that and found a place that she felt much more at home. It, you know, she grew up in a kind of a materialistic kind of um, shallow kind of community. Um, and she was so much happier in Athens because it was, um, had people who were really grappling with the important issues of, uh, of life and not trying to just impress each other. And I think that might've been why she had that reaction when she first was like worried about getting this money. But then once she realized that she could, how, she, how it could make a difference in her community, she just became a very generous person. And also they set up this, um, this foundation, which will, you know, go on in perpetuity. Um, and, um, and th but she worked a lot with Carol Cure, um, who was the founder of Rural Action, and who was also her best friend, to figure out how to do it in an in a way that um, dealt with the power dynamics. There's often this um, very, there's always this difficult power dynamic if you're the giver and somebody's coming to you for money that you feel like you you have to you know grovel to them or. Um, you know, you know, that they have the power over you. And that is something that we constantly have to work on. Um, but we, our goal is to be more round table oriented. Like we are, we, we may have money, but you have ideas, you have solutions, you have, you have the manpower, you know, 
let us um, sit with you and work out. This is our community. We're all in here working on this together. So we have a model of joint design with our projects where we sit and talk with them and say, okay, how's, you know, how's this project going? Where are we headed? You know, and we can have a say and say, well, um, you know, let's, let's figure this out together. We don't, t we don't interfere with how they carry out their projects, but we do have a say with the design of the projects. Well, so often people think of money, I mean, and they use money as a weapon r rather than a tool. And it sounds like that's what you're saying is, look, Let's get beyond this. Uh, it's not to be weaponized. It's simply a tool, and we're all going to work together to accomplish a goal using this particular tool. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So, so highly um, in you know, I'm I'm I like planning, and uh, and I my brain is going, okay, where do you want to be in five to ten years? with the goals that are being set right now? So five years in one minute or less. Okay. <laughs> five years from now at the Sugar Bush Foundation, I really hope that we grow the foundation to, to a larger uh, capacity because there are a lot of projects that we would like to be able to walk with. And, and we believe that there's such a powerful um, result when you have um, successful partnerships between Ohio University and community partners, and the benefits go both ways. But it is often an unnatural partnership because the university has its own un, um, schedule timeline that doesn't necessarily match with the rest of the world because it has different goals. And and but when when there's a there's a good partnership between them, then you have a really powerful result. So we, and we also help love to help give the university a story to tell about itself. And um, they, they could sure use that. I'll tell you, <laughs> they definitely could use that. All right. Well, well, Hailey, we want to thank you for joining us here and we want to thank everybody and remind you, you've been listening to when the biomass hits the wind turbine with Jay and Annie Warmke. We want to thank our award-winning, Emmy-winning oh, yeah. uh, producer, Adam Rich. Yep. And we want to thank all of you for spending just a little bit of time with us. And as your grandmother hopefully probably told you, the secret to a happy and sustainable life is... Play nice with others, clean up your own mess, and use your money for good. Use it and eat your vegetables. All right. So thank you, Hailey. Until next time. Thank Bye. you. That's good advice. All right. Bye-bye. <laughs> good night. I know the stars are dancing in the firelight. Soon we'll be together. Now we'll be revealed. Mother Earth will sing and her children will be healed. See the light and glory blossom in the night. I know the stars are dancing. You can find more information on living sustainably in our unsustainable world at blueroxstation.com.